everybody and welcome to this episode of the LGBTQIA plus Heritage Project History Club. And this evening we are fortunate to be joined by Lisa from Rainbow Refugees NI. And Lisa is going to give us an overview of the Rainbow Refugees group and the work that they do here in Belfast and some experiences from some of the refugees so that we have a better understanding. Lisa, thanks very much for, for coming on tonight and, and telling us all about your group. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, as Joe said, I'm going to do a presentation, so I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes. If you have any burning questions throughout, please feel free to ask them. But of course, there will be plenty of time at the end to ask some questions, but also maybe just to have a conversation in general about our local um, LGBTQIA plus community and how we can maybe be more welcoming, more uh, inviting or a safe space for people um, who are seeking asylum or people who have refugee status. Uh, can I just double check that everybody can hear me okay? Can give okay. a thumbs up. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> that was very synchronized. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Okay, um, I kind of would like to start to maybe just ask the audience and please um, do not worry in any way about your answer, but um, does anybody sort of like know or what do you think, why do we have LGBTQ um, IA plus um, people here in the UK, in Northern Ireland who are seeking asylum? Why, why is that? Does anybody want to venture an answer? Yeah, simply because there are breaches of severe breaches of human rights in other places, in African countries, in the Middle East, in so many places, so many corners of the world that it's impossible to enumer enumerate them. You mm -hmm. have Eritrea, you have Iraq, you have Ethiopia, you have the Northern African countries, you have West Africa, you have Yemen. It's it's endless the number of countries. Mm -hmm. Uganda particularly bad, mm -hmm. and Afghanistan. I've just brought a, well now about ten months since he came in, a refugee from Uganda from Afghanistan, gay refugee into Dublin. He settled down tremendously yeah. well. I won't say any more about that, but I'll let you ask me because he's settled down so well. He's contributing already. So that's that's basically what it is. Uh, yeah. Which have been breached all the time. We do have the protections. Some countries have protections. They say they know they have rights contained in their constitutions, like the Rwanda, for instance. Unless you have the protections along with the rights, you must have both. You have to enforce the rights. Mm -hmm. and if you can't enforce the rights, then you're no use. Yeah. Thank you, Colin. Thanks, Colin. And I think there was a comment by Lorraine saying they're being prosecuted for being LGBTQ plus in certain countries. And yeah, that's exactly right. And as um, uh, Colin said, it's quite um, complex and it's not the same in every country. Different laws apply to different things. Uh, generally speaking, um, same sex any expression of same sex love usually um amongst uh, males is more prosecuted than amongst women and there is historic reasons for that but i'm gonna go and share my screen and we're gonna get started with the presentation okay everybody okay to see this that looks good okay perfect all right so <sighs> This is a little map of where people are being persecuted for being um, a form or a version of LGBTQIA+. It is still criminalized in 63 countries um, all over the world, um, which is basically a roughly a third of all the countries that we have. Um, and um, there's varying degrees, as I said, uh, in some countries it is not socially accepted, but maybe not criminalized. In other countries, it is criminalized. Um, the good news, I guess, here is that when we started Rainbow Refugees um, over two years ago, the number was higher than it is now. Although in some countries, um, they have introduced new pieces of legislation that criminalizes LGBTQ. 
um, the, uh, people. So there is a bit of a sort of like, it, it, it kind of one step forward, two step backwards, maybe type of situation. Um, and of course, um, there is, even if the laws, exist maybe even laws existed uh, to protect the community there's still a lot of homophobia there's still a lot of stigmatism and of course um, transgender and gender diverse people are another group who are often targeted by um, criminalizing lgbtq plus people so in june 2022 is when we sort of um, started rainbow refugees um, we were a small group of activists, of friends, or who were people who were friendly with each other. And we were all working in the refugee and asylum sector. And we, we were all LGBTQ. And we were kind of wondering, because we all worked in the sector, we were kind of wondering, where are the LGBTQ people who are seeking sanctuary here in Northern Ireland, or specifically in Belfast? We all live in Belfast. Because there wasn't really any visibility, there wasn't any space claimed by people. So we kind of thought um, they must exist, but but we don't really see them. And of course, there's reasons for that. Um, I, I'm from Germany, as you can probably hear. And usually in bigger cities in Germany, people kind of claim from different communities, people kind of claim their own space. So they kind of either... Um, can empower each other or, or sort of like, you know, have the confidence to claim various spaces. But I think in Northern Ireland, it's kind of like a mix of maybe the very specific history in Northern Ireland, the very hostile UK asylum system, maybe also, I don't know, legacies of the trouble and also maybe that for, and also that it's just quite small. So you just kind of, you can't really hide and like, you know, like in Germany and Berlin, you can kind of hide in a big city. You can be part of a community and not having everybody know your business. Whereas here, I feel like that's not, that's not really the case. So there's, so there's various reasons why people basically didn't claim that couldn't claim the space for themselves. So um, we were kind of, um, wondering about that and also we got sort of like um, like more and more worried about the anti-migrant rhetoric that were kind of like in the political space in the public space in the media um, so which all sort of like um, yeah just kind of like gave us a little push so we were kind of like okay we really have to do something here so we kind of um, started by putting out a call on social media and that was kind of like the flyer that you can see here on the left side. Um, so, so we just want, wanted to kind of like do a session on Pride. Um, we were kind of hoping that we could maybe join Pride if we have a group of people um, to just kind of like show that visibility. And obviously Pride is, uh, Belfast Pride is a place to be really visible. So that was kind of like the, the original thinking maybe we can have a place in pride and we can sh create visibility through that. And we can sort of like walk with our flags that refugees are welcome and sort of like kind of show that people are welcome and that we are here and sort of like, you know, make them feel safe like that. Um, so we put out the call on social media and we received quite a few um, responses and we sort of like immediately learned, ah, okay, so this is actually needed. <laughs> this is actually something that people want and that is needed. Um, but as you can imagine, we were kind of, yeah, we were just really, really young in our um, development, in our sort of like development. And we didn't, we weren't quite sure yet what it actually would look like. So kind of like Pride was kind of like Pride 2022 was kind of like our first sort of uh, cornerstone. Um, and we asked people to um, come and see what it could look like. And the we had a workshop and we wanted to ask people what could, what would it be that makes you feel safe to basically walk in Pride? Because by then we've learned that a lot of people are not, um, people who are LGBTQ and are here, they're not out because they are very worried about that their communities of origin here would know about this. There's still a lot of homophobia. Um, people were very worried about things getting back to their family and their countries, um, in their home countries. So even that, even though people 
sort of like we're seeking safety and seeking sanctuary here and kind of like going through the asylum process, they, they maybe could be out amongst local friends in terms of I'm, I'm gay or I'm bi, but they couldn't be out when they were with friends, maybe from their home country. And also vice versa, a lot of people said, oh, I don't actually tell people that I'm seeking asylum because, and I get stigmatized immediately. I might sometimes tell people, you know, I'm, I'm studying or I'm just a migrant or, you know, whatever, because I don't want to tell them because then people see me in a very specific way and I hate that. So um, we kind of like learned a lot in the first couple of weeks. I'm starting to work with the group. And what was kind of very clear that safety um, and sort of like um, staying anonymous was a really, really huge deal. So we were able to create these beautiful masks that you can see that people did for themselves. So the masks kind of represent different um, flags where people are from, from the different countries. And the the countries were sort of like also represented on um, a placard. And that was from um, where, where LGBTQ um, is at the time. I mean, this is a, a moment in time, uh, 2022, where it was still criminalized. So that was kind of like our sort of like origin story. Um, and now we're it's over two years later and we have grown into a community group where sort of like our number one thing is building community. Um, we offer practical support. So um, the group is currently run by six volunteers and we all sort of work in the sector and we all have different skills and we all have sort of like our own network. So we offer practical support to people around um, support with their asylum interviews. Um, we signpost to different statutory services or to other charities. Um, because we are volunteering, we can't really do a massive amount of casework. Of course, we try to help as much as we can, but sometimes it is much better to actually signpost to the organizations that we are paid for and have um, professionals within that specific sort of like area. Um, we do some campaigning. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later, about a report that we brought out. Um, we go to protests, we go to rallies. Um, we try to uh, make sure that when people um, sort of have a story, to, if people want to tell their story, try to make sure, okay, how, how can that person be helped to tell their story or support it in a safe way? Um, and we try to do a lot of cooperation that can look in very various different forms, but with other community groups, with other uh, organizations and charities, basically um, anybody who is interested in supporting LGBTQ um, people who seek asylum and or and or have refugee status here in Northern Ireland. I hope it's okay that I'm saying Northern Ireland. Um, I could also say the North of Ireland. I'm from Germany, so I'm just, please don't read too much into this. <laughs> um, I might also just change it, whatever comes first, basically. Um, so if we talk about our community, we talk about our group. So the one thing we always do is we have a monthly meetup. So there are, we meet in different places um, and we have a lot of fun. And kind of like fun is the number one thing about those meetings because life is very hard and very difficult, as you can imagine. So um, we have we try to do um, either a fun movie. We always have food. We do games. We have workshops. Sometimes we have different people coming in if they have a certain expertise or if they offer a certain service sort of like, um, then we sort of like try to connect people. Um, twice we've run a, um, um, a sexual health clinic. Um, so um, yeah, lots of different things. And it kind of like takes a different form every month. And of course this month um, we do a Halloween meetup because just the season. Um, I already said that um, another thing that we do is Belfast Pride. So this is of our first year in Pride, where we actually asked to then eventually lead the parade, which was a big honor for us. Of course, our first sort of like uh, time being in existence and we were at the front already. Uh, the theme back then was United in Diversity. So it was quite fitting and yeah, it was good fun. Um, this is Pride 2023. Um, again, we were part of it. We had grown uh, by then in numbers. We had grown in supporters. Um, we were lucky enough to win two awards um, at the uh, Pride 
uh, at the Belfast Pride Award Ceremony, which was a big honor for us and also really showed our members that uh, Belfast or Northern Ireland kind of like sees them and that that there is sort of like respect respect and that there is love, which is yeah very important for our group to just know that they are being welcomed. And then this year Pride, again, loads of fun. Um, and again, the awards were kind of, I think, more professional even. <laughs> and again, we won two awards, which was really, really exciting for us. And we kind of hope to keep it going and hopefully next year win again. Maybe not two, but at least one uh, award. So the other sort of like flip side of um, the other side of the coin of rainbow refugees yes we have a lot of fun yes we have a beautiful colorful wonderful family community um but the uh, daily life for people is still incredibly difficult um there's something that we call a hostile environment where basically the uk government basically set up a system that is really isolating for people um i'm not i'm not sure how much you know about the asylum process but it's a really difficult time it's a really jarring time um people um only get 49 uh pounds a week um that is and that has to pay if they're in accommodation that has to pay for their food their data their phone their toiletries um basically everything that isn't sort of like connected to accommodation and if they're in a hotel where the meals are provided um they only get 8.8 uh, six uh, uh, pence a week which for example if you imagine if you take the bus even once <laughs> um, that money could be gone already so it's incredible incredibly limited amount of time uh, money and at the same time people have don't have the right to work so they don't have the chance to gain any more any any sort of like uh, additional uh, money um, a lot of people who are LGBTQ have been um, rejected by their own family, by their own community. So it's not that they have many people to reach out to. Some people have sort of like lost touch with everybody and really had to start from sort of like from zero when they come here. Um, there's a lot of fear while they're waiting for their asylum decision. Um, it can be quite long. It can be months and months and months of waiting without knowing what the future will hold, if they're allowed to stay here, um, if they if they can live here in safety, and of course, if you are claiming asylum on the on the base that you are on the basis that you are LGBTQ, um, you have to prove basically to the Home Office that you are queer, that you are LGBTQ, and if you imagine if you're coming from a life where all you did was hide that because otherwise you would be in danger. And then you kind of have to show evidence. That's that can be really difficult. Um, on top of the home of home office interviews can be really difficult because people get asked incredibly um, difficult questions. They have to maybe recall very very difficult um, situations from their life. Maybe very um, like very very much trauma that was experienced. And for some people, it might will be the first time where they actually spoke in somewhat in a somewhat open way about being LGBTQ. Because in a lot of countries, you wouldn't talk about that at all. You wouldn't talk really talk about sex. You wouldn't talk about any of that. And then all of a sudden, they have to talk to a complete stranger about this. So it's 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 a really difficult process. So there's a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety around the interview. And if you are a person who is seeking asylum, um, of course, there's intersectionality issues. Um, many people um, look like they're not from here, whatever that means. But we have people of color. Um, we have people with different religions. Um, if you can imagine the uh, July incidents were incredibly difficult for people. Um, there was a lot of racist incidents and a lot of racist attacks in Belfast. Uh, and that's really difficult to navigate for people who get sort of like triggered because that actually reminds them maybe of situations that they have um, felt when they were at home or something that happened to them. And then they came here and all of a sudden they feel like, again, oh, actually can't really leave um, 
my apartment. I can't leave my house because I'm worried that I'm going to get tagged on the streets. So that was, the summer was a really difficult time for our members. Um, we Part of our campaigning is um, we'll try to, whenever there is an issue that is specific to our group, we'll try to raise awareness. So we've published a report uh, this year in June that was basically about safe accommodation for LGBTQIA plus people seeking sanctuary, seeking asylum in Northern Ireland. Um, a lot of people get uh, put up with other people in a house, in a hotel. These are people they don't know. Sometimes these are people that come from the same country as them. Sometimes they come from a different country. And unfortunately, the levels of homophobia are extremely high. And what we found out through our members is that a lot of the accommodation is not safe for them. They are um, sort of, um, um, there's a lot of uh, physical abuse, a lot of threats being made, uh, a lot of verbal language that isn't really nice, um, there's sexual abuse, um, really high rates of mental distress, and kind of really poor prevention and kind of like a poor response um, about the uh, body that is kind of like responsible to keep them safe. Um, it kind of doesn't really fall in the same category as domestic abuse, which we kind of think it should because it is happening within the domestic environment, but it's kind of treated differently. And we've had some really um, yeah, unfortunate incidents where um, those cases weren't handled correctly. So we compiled a report and we were kind of like that, that came along with a set of recommendations for different bodies, um, how to actually keep people safe when they come over here uh, and are being accommodated. Um, we've also done a survey uh, amongst our members and amongst the wider community. And basically um, the um, results were quite staggering. 78% of respondents have experienced some form of abuse or violence from other refugees or asylum seekers. Um, and that was on the grounds of being LGBTQ. Um, 74 reported bullying uh, consistent uh, with so called honor based abuse, which is kind of like saying if you're Muslim um, and I'm a Muslim and I'm telling you, you bring shame to the Muslim community because you are gay. So that's kind of like what we mean with that. And actually, 44% have tried to take their own life. So that is an insane high number if you think about it. So it's a really, really um, big problem. And we try to support people. Another reason why we feel like a safe space is really needed for people, a space where people can talk about these things. And we try to um, signpost as much as we can, especially around mental health. Um, another finding that we had was that 78% said that they were concerned that the interpreters uh, would report details of their sexuality to their community. So again, it's often the case that, you know, you, you become an interpreter, uh, you have your own language, um, and then if you live in the same sort of like country or the same area, you're part of the same community. So you could find somebody who is part of your uh, community or from your country of origin, and then they're also your interpreter at, you know, at health or your asylum interview or whatever. And that creates a lot of fear and actually keeps people from withholding information. So 58% have actually reported within our survey that they withheld information about the sexuality uh, from service providers because of the interpreter, because they were either worried that they would maybe not treat this confidentially or because they were generally worried that they would be maybe judged or, you know, could be a, could be various, could be various reasons. So coming to the end, which I'm sure you're, you're glad to know, coming to the end of my presentation and um, usually get asked sort of like, what, what can we do? <laughs> That's kind of like one of the common things people um are very eager to help. People want to help. So the first thing we kind of know is, you know, we educate. We kind of tell people it's really good to educate yourself because the more facts you know, the better you can argument <laughs> if there's anything, or you can the better you can make a case for somebody. So educating yourself about the facts and figures is really important. Um, and then if you're working for an organization, if you have a community group, if you're running a project to think about when you set it up or when you're running it, how can you make, make um, LGBTQI plus refugees comfortable? 
Um, how would a queer refugee know that you're a safe person when they talk to you? And if you are part of the local LGBTQI scene, you can maybe sort of like think about, is this a welcoming space? Um, are we sort of inviting people who we're not always inviting? And how can we sort of like, um, yeah, maybe do better, be better, and yeah, keep growing our community. If you want to support us, of course, you can. We have a website, Rainbow Refugees. We are on Instagram, on Twitter, and on Facebook. So if you want to support us, please uh, give us a like uh, or you know, reach out to us if you have any questions or any ideas for further collaboration. And we also have some cool merch, uh, some cool T-shirts and pins on our uh, website, which we are currently selling. That was kind of it. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yeah, I kind of hope I was within the time limit. And I don't know if you already have a question. No, okay, that was um, that was from Katrine, actually, who is here as well. And Katrine is also uh, part of the board. I don't know, Katrine, um, if you want to quickly say hello, and maybe you can think if I, I don't know if you're still there. And if not, that's, that's fine, too. I know you were here for emotional support as well. Oh, there she is. Oh, I don't have anything to add. I think that was pretty perfect. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, the only thing I had put a comment because I was thinking when Colin was mentioning about different kinds of reasons people were here, uh, we often forget that people can be here for other reasons and they are LGBT. Mm -hmm. So yeah, sometimes we find some, uh, some of our members have been people who did not come originally seeking asylum for being LGBT necessarily. Mm -hmm. And then it just happens. So I think sometimes um, people kind of assume that you'll be a rainbow refugee if you come from certain countries, but you can also come from much wider range of countries than people think. But yeah. I think, uh, yeah, you've said it all. Not sure. I have a wee question, Lisa. Um, yeah, of course. Just for people who maybe aren't aware. Can you explain the difference between a refugee and an asylum seeker? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's, if you think about the sort of like the process, you know, as a journey or, you know, kind of like different statuses, you know, so everything, so the overall umbrella term is your immigration status. So um, I'm not from here, so I, I also have an immigration status. And the sort of like under um, international human uh, rights law, everybody has the right to seek asylum. So when you arrive here uh, in Northern Ireland, in the UK, um, you have, and this is why it is insane to talk about illegal um, migration or sort of like illegal, because it isn't, it's not illegal to seek asylum. You're allowed to do that. So when you first seek asylum, when you make your claim and you're in the system and you're waiting for your decision, that is what we call an asylum seeker. And it comes with a very specific sort of like set sets of uh, rights and responsibilities. So you don't have the right to work. You don't have no recourse to public funds, um, but you do get accommodation. You basically get taken care of that kind of like the basics are being taken care of. But above that, there isn't really much anything else for you to do here. You just kind of have to wait. Once you get a positive decision, you get your refugee status and you kind of like, um, yeah, by UK law, seen as a refugee. Um, but it really doesn't, it basically means you have the same rights as everybody else who lives here. So there isn't really a lot of different, there is something about, um, being re uh, reuni reunified, is that the right word? <laughs> reunited, with, reunited, <laughs> reunited with your family, that it kind of like clicks in when, when you get refugee status. But above from that, it basically means you have the right to work, you can study, you can access benefits, you know, like kind of like all of that. Um, but the UK government is being, especially uh, the former one we had was being quite, um, sort of like tricky with different statuses. So 
Now we actually have ended up with a bunch of different statuses. So you have the different resettlement schemes, you know, that those were, you know, whenever the UK government is talking about safe and the safe routes, the legal routes, they're basically talking about a really small amount of people that this UK government basically decided there are um, the right people to sort of like, you know, like good, there's often like a good and a bad refugee kind of like rhetoric or kind of like, you know, illegal and legal refugees and all of that. But the UK government basically has run programs for um, people from Syria. It has run a big program for, for, for people from Ukraine, which I'm sure you've all heard about. Um, it is currently running a program for people from Afghanistan, very small number is coming here to Northern Ireland. And we've also uh, had a program for people from Hong Kong, which is called British Nationals Overseas. Um, so those people are also technically refugees in the sort of like broader, wider global sense, but the UK government doesn't call them refugees. So they have kind of like either international protection or human humanitarian protection, or there's all these sort of like, so it gets actually really, really confusing. And when we're talking legally, we have to be quite specific, but generally, as I said in the beginning, if you seek asylum, you're an asylum seeker. And once you get your positive decision, you are a refugee. Sorry, one thing probably worth adding is even when you have refugee status, that can be for a very short number of years and then you have mm -hmm. to apply again. So it keeps people in quite an uncertain situation for a long time. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, the refugee status is not permanent? It depends a little bit. It can be between one, three and five years. And again, it kind of depends on which way you've entered the UK, which program sort of, so it can be difficult. For example, now with Ukraine, the Ukraine government has made it quite clear that they kind of don't want people to get really long um, visas or really long uh, immigration statuses because they are hoping the war is over soon and then they want people to come back and basically help to rebuild the country, which you can understand from sort of like, yeah, of course, but what that means that in the meantime, people who maybe have fled and now, especially if they have children or something, they kind of want to build a life and kind of want to have that security, that safety, but they still have a very short um, permission to stay because of exactly that. So it can be quite tricky because it's, yeah, it can be quite difficult to navigate what is ethically legal, sort of like what is the right way to go about these things. Uh, there are very, very few safe routes in, you know, statutory routes in, government approved routes in. Uh, I brought an asylum seeker in from Kabul, from Afghanistan, to the Irish government. It took me from the 6th of May last year until February to get him in. It was a good process. It worked very well, but I had a lot of help. I had to get him accommodation. We had to get him get ten thousand euro raised. Now the Irish government were quite good. They said seven thousand would do all right. But we had a community group sent around that particular gay guy. Uh, he's now in Dublin with friends of mine. It's a very moving story. He left his mother behind, who's a women's rights worker. Uh, so technically speaking, she would be entitled to. Uh, avail of the Irish scheme for safe routes in, but she doesn't want to because her husband's there and her family are there. So there are all these there are all these terrible things, big decisions people have to make even before they leave. It's very, very difficult. Now with my friend, uh, and I've been down to see him today, he can't come up north, so I go down to see him from time to time. He's now hoping to get to Trinity next year to study law. Very, very bright, very good English. Twenty three. Gosh, it through the world. He's a wonderful guy. Uh, these are gifts to us. A lot of these people we meet are gifts. They've had to struggle very hard. They've had to work so hard. They've had to adjust to new circumstances all the time, new cultures all the time, including trying to work out their own culture and how they're going to keep that going, how they're going to um, avoid any of the difficult issues with their friends from the same countries. And that's a big problem. Some of them end up living in their rooms all the time in the 
you know, the mayor's accommodation, uh, and they end up staying in the rooms because they're afraid of they're afraid of the other inhabitants. And we know there have been abusive cases. And Gareth and I know about you know one or two of those two those cases through queer space, which is a really safe place for people to go to as well during you know, twice a month. Uh, so there you are. I'm also the founding member of Belfast City of Sanctuary um, and uh, first chair of it, still on the board, still working away at that, uh, racial equality and all the other things. Uh, so it's my world, you know, in retirement, retired lawyer, it's my world. And I'm very happy to have that world. I'm very privileged to have the education I've had and the help I've had and the understanding I have and the love I have for other people, for my neighbor. And my neighbor is away, way far away. That's my neighbor. Um, and that's the sort of philosophy I, I pursue all the time. There's Garrett wants to say something. So I'll stop. Thanks, Colin. I have, to, I have two questions, really. Um, one is, um, do, you, do you, Rainbow Refugees, do you work in collaboration with uh, other organisations um, supporting our diverse communities in, in Northern Ireland? I'm thinking about uh, organisations such as the MILA, um, um, the minority organisations and stuff. And sort of what's, you know, and have you encountered any issues or problems uh, when working in collaboration? Uh, because that would be a natural way of obviously reaching out and to, to isolated people, probably mm -hmm. from within those networks as well. And the second question would be a lot of people, um, thankfully, successfully navigate their way through the system and they find and they rebuild lives. And does the organization um, involve or would there be, is there any way of involving those people and helping the people that are coming through their similar journeys? Because obviously they would be in a really good position to do that because I can understand people just want to get on with their lives, but I'm sure there's a lot of people who would want to give back and help other people as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think I'm going to ask you or answer your second question first, kind of like work my way backwards. Um, a hundred percent because, of course, we have sort of like we've been growing in numbers and membership, and um, what we see is that once people have get their status, there are often changed people, like they look different. <laughs> it is literally like you've swapped them out. Um, um, the 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 time being sort of like in the system and waiting for a decision is horrendous and it really takes a big toll on your mental health. Um, so of course, um, and people are are very, very good. And yeah, of course, that's also like one part of our community network that people, you know, give each other, have that peer support and people can support each other. Um, the, the, the downside of Northern Ireland is though that we see that most people move away when they have their mm -hmm. refugee status. Um, that is for different reasons, employment being number one, there are much, much better opportunities in England and Scotland in terms of how you get into employment than here. Um, one example is sort of like the health sector um, there's very few pathways for surgeons and dentists and and other sort of like medical staff into the into their job here in Northern Ireland, which is if you is insane because we need people, <laughs> um, but it's just not the structures aren't there, so people kind of have to leave and they have to go to England and Scotland, and of course, mm -hmm. um, if you're LGBTQ, um, the the community is of course much much bigger and more diverse in England, for example. So we've had. I can imagine sadly, also for housing as well. Yeah, although yeah, although I guess it depends on where you go. I mean, housing isn't exactly easy in England either, but um, but it is really difficult here as well. You know, and sometimes people kind of like just want to try. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, employability and sort of just like, um, I think employability and a big and kind of like a bigger diverse community is, is a massive pull for people to go. And we've seen many friends leave, sadly. Um, so there is a lot of, we lose a lot of amazing people. As Colin said, you know, the people have amazing talents, skills, um, amazing personalities. And we sadly, yeah, we just lose them because we don't give, we can't, we, they don't have the right opportunities here. Um which yeah is hopefully changing and uh, with time and hopefully as Northern Ireland gets sort of like grows not not necessarily in size but maybe you know sort of like in, in openness and diversity there will be better, better opportunities in terms of collaboration with other organizations yes hundred um, percent I think the one thing that is important to remember we're all volunteers every uh, every single person who is. Um, uh, volunteering uh, for Rainbow Refugees is also in full-time employment, so we can't do everything, although we try to do as much as we can. Um, if we, we've, we've done many, many joint sessions with other with other organizations. Um, we're in connection with, of course, with the Rainbow Project and Here and I, and there's a lot of support and try to try like collaboration there. Um, we've been really, really blessed in terms of being supported by, for example, us folk have done their T-shirt illustrations, they're a queer illustration company, and they've done the T-shirts, um, the T-shirt logo for us. Um, and it's absolutely brilliant. We love, I don't know if you've seen our T-shirts, but they're really oh, yeah. beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are supported, you know, by the Show Some Love people. We can use their space if, uh, for our board meetings. And they give us toiletries for for and sort of like uh, packs for for our members. And yeah, I'm probably forgetting a lot of people here, and I'm really yeah. sorry. I'm thinking. Other... I'm thinking uh, about sorry outside the queer community. Um, I'm yes, thinking, yes. You know, like yeah. mainstream. There's possibly one thing I would say. We have had some support from migrant support organizations. I think some of them would be a little bit quieter about it than others. Also from churches, I think sometimes it's good to know, um, you know, there's some some of the more progressive churches would be very supportive of LGBT asylum seekers, but they'd be a bit quiet about it. Uh, certainly the Northwest Migrant Forum have been very good. You know, mm -hmm. there are places where yeah. we have good support, uh, but... It is complicated, yeah. And as for the what you were saying, uh, Gareth, about um, LGBT asylum seekers or refugees supporting each other, that happens a lot. One of our board members is an LGBT person from the refugee community. One of our ex-members is now working in the refugee sector in England. So people do, but for a lot of people, you know, they want to move on. And I think Lisa's right. Okay, anybody else got any questions? Yeah, in relation to Belfast, um, I have alluded to the fact that I was one of the founder members, probably the guy who drove it for a lot of the time, Belfast City of Sanctuary. It's a part of the Sanctuary movement right throughout the UK and Ireland. Sat on the board of Dublin for a, for a few years as well. So Belfast declared itself to be a city of sanctuary about two years ago, at one of our uh, seminars, one of our well, one of our large meetings up in North Belfast, and I don't know what's been happening about that. I must actually speak to our board the next meeting in December, see just how far that is going. But I think we should drive that from our point of view about refugees being welcome generally in Northern Ireland and LGBTQI plus. Queer, just let's call it queer. And Gareth and I have had this discussion over the years about queer, and <laughs> I expect him to smile about it. But you know, I've come to the conclusion that queer is the best word to use, the most inclusive word, and it includes everything. You know, that's not heterosexual. And I really think that you know, from our point of view, we probably need to do this work in the city of sanctuary. We're talking about Belfast now, although we do schools of sanctuary in Derry as well. We have 74 schools in Belfast and Derry, and we have scholarships for people in Queens, and not the University of Ulster yet. And Belfast uh, Met is a college of sanctuary. Uh, so all of these have to be prepared to get the award. 
uh, and that's in general terms, not in queer terms. But you know, that's mm -hmm. important that that we that we have that element. But yeah. I think that's where the problem is sometimes, Colin. That yeah. people are mentalized that they think we're ref we're supporting refugees, and they don't think. LGBT people are refugees, and they really need to put that in their heads that when you're refu yeah. supporting refugees, you're supporting every refugee, and there is not a difference that you, you know, we have to make a difference, obviously, as yeah. rainbow refugees. But yeah. if you're supporting refugees, that includes the gays, that includes the queers, that includes, you know, and people often forget that. And we're stronger if we are inclusive, Katrine. You know, we really are. We are really stronger. But that's we are challenging. Inclusive. But that is challenging because you will find a lot yeah. of obstacles. Yeah. yeah. The, mm. the, the one big problem is that the Home Office does not accept people who are LGBT or queer. They don't accept them unless they go to a, a tribunal. Now, occasionally they will, but uh, they're looking for the evidence. They want the evidence. That means people like a number of us here have to appear before tribunals. I've got two on this coming month, lower and upper tribunals. Uh, and, you know, these people have been here for, for five, five years here now. It's very, very trying. You imagine somebody cooked up in a room for five years. Uh, because they're gay, they feel they can't go out or they feel they have to be very cautious or they have to think every time they go out. You or I wouldn't have to think about going out into the open world. There are all those problems as well. If they want to worship, and same presumably with the mosque as well, they have to, maybe they, they want to be quite to be open with people. You just can't help it. You know, for me, I just nowadays, I I was married for 30 years and had four kids. And then in the mid, in my mid early 50s, I just I realized it was gay and it was, was gay for that matter. And then came out and it was a tremendously difficult. I had a terrible journey. I mean, had mental health issues as well, trying to come out. So, you know, that's me as a Western solicitor, well educated, with a good family, great background, and all of that, and money. And you know, people coming from countries in Africa and Asia and so forth. They don't have any of that support. They have nothing to fall back on. So, you know, there there are huge obstacles. Uh, I'm sure. Well, a lot of our people are educated. Just want to throw that in, but I'm pretty sure that's not what you meant. I could talk for hours. Yeah, but I'm not going to. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I think no, you, I think that's right. I think we don't want to generalize either. No, we don't. We don't. And people have various, you know, levels of skills and and education and um yeah i mean all of it like the whole sort of spectrum in terms of you know like from maybe you know like being able to read and write to phds you know like the whole spectrum is sort of like represented um and i see that gareth has a stand up and i just want to say one thing about what colin said and yes absolutely um and when we think about trauma that yeah there's there's just an added layer and um as you can see um katrine and myself are here and um nobody from sort of like from our members are here because the fear is really really high um what, as soon as things are being recorded as soon as things are being sort of like put on youtube it's out there for the world you know and it's very difficult to tell the future so if you're in the asylum process you kind of um might be worried about you know saying the wrong thing but if you have your secure status you know as katrine said even then it's not you know it's never secure 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 you might um have some sort of connection way back way home that you don't want anybody to find out so it's a really sort of, yeah, there's a lot of different layers to it. And the level of trauma is incredibly high. And you maybe wouldn't know it if you walked into one of our meetings, you know, everybody had a good time. People are laughing, dancing. But the experiences that our members have uh, spoken about, the uh, sort of like the things that they had to survive in terms of um, sexual abuse, uh, human trafficking, um, 
violence towards them, maybe from their own community, their own family. It's absolutely horrendous. And I can really, 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 really only say that um, I'm so in awe of how much uh, resilience people have. And it is absolutely amazing um, what people sort of, you know, how people can still, yeah, just be present, have fun. And it's, 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 it's really, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, Gareth, please come in. Yeah, no, just a, a positive uh, observation at the Belfast for All rally on Saturday, the anti-racist rally. It was really encouraging to see or to hear many inclusive chants, you know, uh, on trans rights, on queer rights and mixed up amongst every other uh, aspect of, of diversity. And I think that's that 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 is really, really encouraging. So because it must, you know, there, there must have been people there that that give courage to as well like and uh, maybe I'm just making that assumption but I think it's just really really good that uh, that that that, uh, that um, queer issues are included in in, yeah. in such an open and public way so yeah good. no we, we, we yeah we, we would of course talk to the organizers and you know the Belfast uh, activist scene is quite small so yeah um, I think uh, generally we are, we are very lucky with having a very inclusive scene um, when it comes to queer issues, when it comes to women's rights issues, all of that. Um, and yeah, and I, I was there myself um, on Saturday and it was actually really lovely. It was a really, really good protest. I really enjoyed that. Great. Yeah. Excellent. Um, just to... So Anyone else have a question? You can raise your hand or pop it in the chat. We're going to stop the recording soon. So uh, anyone who didn't want to be part of the recording can ask a question there. Um, I just have a quick question if nobody else wants to go before me. Um, they said just about the, um, the UK citizenship exam. Do refugees have to take that? First of all, I'm not an immigration lawyer, so <laughs> that's that's my little disclaimer. <laughs> so I can't give any immigration advice. But um, yeah. so for for so it, again, it, it kind of depends. It's it's not it's not the same answer for everybody. A lot of people w would want to take it because it comes, of course, with um, different, you know, like with a with rights and um, with a type of identification that maybe you know gives you more. Um, free uh more freedom to travel you know about different borders and everything um maybe some people um have know that they can never return to their home country so maybe their passport actually you know isn't really sort of like working for them anymore um maybe they can't get you know so there's there's a, many different reasons um as far as i know and maybe i katrine keep me right here but i don't think it's it's a that or maybe less for small people, um, for not for small number of people, it's not compulsory, but it's definitely recommended for a lot of people, and a lot of people really want to do it. Okay, I have okay, a sample question. Yeah, I've I've got a sample question from the citizenship exam, and just be interesting to see if anybody in the audience knows it. The answer, uh, the question is, which king? was executed in 1649 and it's a multiple choice question so you have a choice between James the first Charles the second James the seventh or Charles the first the seventh my god I would say who cares well, Charles the second, <laughs> that's the right answer Gareth <laughs> I'll tell you who cares I'll tell you who cares anybody who tries to get the UK citizenship oh yeah, no. I know they have to who, who respects the right to life as well. I know that was very. I, I used to tutor people on that book. Life in the UK. You know the book Life in the UK, where you had to learn everything. Yes. Stupid thing. You know, the Stone Age and all of that stuff, and all about these kings and their wives and all the rest. A very brief yes. story is that my mother's family had to leave their castle in County Wexford because it was being bombed <laughs> by Charles. Uh, by uh, Cromwell's forces because of the wrong sort of loyalists and the wrong sort of prod. And that's all I'll say. <laughs> did, did anybody know? know the, did anybody actually know the answer? Because I, I honestly wouldn't know. <laughs> no, I, I have no idea. And I tried oh, to click on it there, but 
you have to do the whole test to get the answers at the end. I don't want yeah. to do that. <laughs> Have you done it, Joe? And it, it is true that a lot of people I've seen anyway, a lot of families who stay here, refugee families, and I presume a lot of LGBT refugees as well, will end up wanting to get the UK status at some stage because yeah. otherwise you are stuck in having to reapply. Yeah, yeah, um, that's right. It's, yeah. it's hard to get long term, you know. That's a lot of people that feel safe because you don't know if you're, you know, if you're not European and you're living um, anywhere in Europe, you don't know if you're, even if you're given a long term status, you don't know if you have it forever. So for a lot of people, of course, they will want to try to get citizenship and it's not easy. And it's expensive as well. Very it expensive. is expensive. Just, and yeah. that's one thing, yeah, that's one thing that often we find when people get refugee status, everybody assumes that say they're sorted. They're not sorted. You have to find employment and then you have to work for your next stage of your immigration status. So it is not not an easy life being a rainbow refugee. A rainbow refugee. Absolutely not an easy life. Okay, thank you so much everyone. I'm going to stop the recording now and then we'll have some time for more questions.